Y'all know what's going on. It's time for another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker, and welcome to the show, y'all. Look here. Now, they've been arrested. They've been charged. And now it's time to go to court. They've been in jail for quite a few months. They've written each other back and forth. You know what I'm saying? They're in the same jail, but you got men housed in one section, women housed in another. They've written each other back and forth. And now, bro knows that she is the one that told the police about him and he's upset he is upset he got some anger towards her and she understands but she was scared even though she's older than him and she told him she was going to make it right she was going to whatever she had to do it was her intent to make this right but how do you make that right what you gonna do? What's she gonna do? Go in there and take the charge. It's not how this works. A lot of people talk that stuff, but that ain't how they get down, y'all. I'm telling you. So anyway, here we go. It's time to go to trial. They go to trial, and they don't. The judge don't sever the trial. Both of them go to trial together. They both sitting at the table. The jury is seated. And now the DA is arguing the case. He's presenting the evidence to the DA, to the to the jury about what they did. He tells exactly. He tells the jury exactly what the the uh, his gal had told the detectives when they picked her up. They told them everything. So now the jury it goes out. Now wait, hold on. Let me back up. The the defense gets up. This is important, y'all. The lawyers get up for her, and they argue that she was a victim of circumstances. They talk about her life, they talk about the things that she went through and all this and that, and how she was a victim when she got in that car and the man wanted to have sex with her and to get high with her. And you could see the jury. Folks said he could see the jury buying it. They were looking at her like somebody had taken advantage of her. You feel me? Now keep in mind, even though Bra was younger than her, the streets had aged him. The streets had aged him. The, her lawyer had prepared her very, very well and told her, when you come in there, make sure you look as young as you can. So she done scrubbed and exfoliated her face and got all of these things, you know what I'm saying? <coughs> Sent in to her by her attorney. So that when she came in there and they had allowed them to wear street clothes, at this time, so she looks like she's way younger than what she actually is, which doesn't matter, but she made herself look as kid-like as possible, as innocent-like as possible. Bray even told me, he said she had on this blue dress with flowers on it, you know? And it made her look like she was a young, innocent person. And that's okay, that's the strategy. But bro said now, he's got on a suit and a tie, but he's upset. He don't understand the game that's being played. He don't understand that presentation is part of it. So he's sitting now mean mugging the whole time, looking mad about everything, and he's constantly staring at her. He ain't paying attention to the jury, staring at him. So his lawyer gets up and argues that, that he it was actually protecting now. This is what he tells his lawyer, I was protecting my family. So the lawyer tries to make that argument for him that he was protecting his family. She was in danger. Totally ignoring the fact that they were up there selling drugs and prostituting. They wanted to make sure that the jury understood that she was in danger and he came to her aid. Now the people on that jury, they're looking at it. They're not buying that. They're not buying that. What they saw was two people they were out in the streets breaking the law, doing whatever they wanted to do, and somebody ended up getting killed as a result. As a result of that. Now, keep in mind that this person that ended up getting killed, he was out there to buy sex. 
He was out there to buy drugs. That doesn't diminish the value of his life. Don't get it twisted. Don't don't take that message from me because that is not what I'm saying. But the jury didn't calculate that this lifestyle, sometimes in this lifestyle, things happen. And what they wanted to do is send a message that said no matter what is going on in your life, to kill somebody is not allowed. They're not going. They're not going. So after about two hours of deliberation, listen to me, man. About two hours of deliberation, they came back in there and they found both of them guilty of murder. First degree, premeditated murder. So they were both sitting there and when, when, the, when the verdict was read by the, the judge, she just laid her head down on the desk that she was sitting there and she was sobbing so hard, crying. The police that were behind them, it was two females, they tried to console her as they were lifting her up to come on, you gotta go, it's gonna be all right. It's gonna be all right, because the judge had sentenced them. He's sitting there at the table in shock. And the two officers that were behind him, they wanted her to get out first. Because they knew, based off of their uh, experience, that this could turn ugly real fast because if she hadn't have said what she said, then maybe bruh wouldn't have been in there. You feel me? So they would like get her out first because he might turn on her. So as they were taking her out the back, she turned back and she looked at him and she said, I love you. I'm sorry. I love you. I love you. And he looked at her and didn't say a word. And he just stood up. He turned towards the officers. They put the handcuffs on him. He already had shackles on. Well, they never took the shackles off. He stood up. They put the hands in front of him. They put the handcuffs on him. And they escorted him out the back. And when they took him in the back, before they took him back to the jail, he had to change clothes and whatnot. So they took the handcuffs off and the shackles off. And they, put, they gave him his orange jumpsuit. And he changed clothes calmly, peacefully, and all this and that. And one of the officers that were there watching the cage was about his age. It was about his age. And he said, he remember that officer telling him, man, you're going to have to stay strong, man. You're going to have to stay strong. So, bro said, how much time do I have to do on this life sentence? He didn't know this officer, but he was scared. Fear had set in. He's trying to figure out, does life mean life? Will I die in here? Do I ever get a chance to get out? And the officer said, yeah, you get a chance to get out. He said, but you got to serve 51 years on this life sentence. It's 51 or 52, actually, but the, 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 the officer told him 51 years, and I think it's 52. So folks said he sat down on the bench in the holding tank. And it, that's when the emotions hit him. He bent over, put his head in his hand, and he started to cry. And then the two officers that were about to escort him back to the county jail, they came in. They said, stand up, bro. Got to take you back. So he, they told him to stand up and walk to the cage, put his hands behind his back. They put the handcuffs on him. Then they told him, walk towards the wall. And then when you get to the wall, get down on your knees. So he walked towards the wall, he got down on his hands and knees, and then one of the officers stood behind him with the hand on the middle of his back. The other officer put the shackles on him, and then they helped him stand up. And when they helped him stand up, he stumbled. He stumbled. He said he almost passed out because the reality was sitting in. The reality was sitting in. He just turned in 18, 19, rather. Just turned in 19 at this time. And now he's finna go to the penitentiary for the next 52 years. 52 years. I'm not talking about 52 at a percentage. 52 years straight, no break in the penitentiary. So the reality of that, the weight of that is hitting him. And they understand, they go through this every day. So they brace him and they got their arms between his arms, you know what I'm saying? And they're helping him walk. And they get him back to the jail. They're talking to him. They're consoling him. On the one hand, they're consoling him because they want to keep him calm. On the other hand, they might care a little bit. 
But it's their job to get him back to the holding facility, to the jail. They get him back to the jail. When they get him back to the jail and they get him up in there and they take the handcuffs off him, he tells the jailer, he said, look, y'all got... Because normally in the jail, it takes a while to get transferred to the penitentiary. And at the jail, you basically lock down if you're not working and all this and that. Right now that he's been convicted, he knows that they're going to put him on a different floor of the floor where people are being held to get shipped off to the prison. And it's not going to be that much movement for him. You feel what I'm saying? Because he's got a life sentence. So they're going to keep him locked down most of the time. So he tells the jailer, look here, man, you got a week to get me up out of here. It's going to be a problem. And the jailer totally understood what he said. I'm going to get you up out of here as quickly as I can, son. So the next three days, he's panicking. He's getting more anxious. He gets a letter in the mail from her. And she's apologizing, this, this, and that, saying that she's sorry. And whatever she got to do, she going to make it right. Just tell her what to do. He tore the letter up and flushed it down the toilet. Tore it up and flushed it down the toilet. On that fourth day, that morning, they came. They knocked on the door said, pack up, bag and baggage. You're, going, you're on your way to the penitentiary. They packed him up, and he was shipped off to the penitentiary. Now he's in the penitentiary and time is going on. He gets another letter. He's been there about two months now. He gets another letter. She's been shipped out to the penitentiary. Now she's at the women's prison. He's at the male facility. And she's writing him in these letters. It's almost from a delusional state of mind. She's talking to him like they got a future together. Like they're going to be together when they get out of here and everything going to work out. As if she doesn't understand it. 51 years is a long time to do. And she's talking to him like... It's not that long. They're going to be okay. Well, they just got to eat good, exercise, and do all of these types of things. And then they're going to be getting out, and then they're going to be able to go on with their lives. He's not feeling that. He's not feeling that. So he don't even write her back. And she's writing him every week a letter. Every week she's getting a, a letter in the mail to him, and he's reading them, and he's tearing them up. And then after a while, he stopped even reading them, and he's tearing them up, and he's throwing them away. He don't want to hear from her. He don't want to hear nothing from her. Because in his mind, if not for her doing what she did, he don't end up in jail. And that's, a, and that's the way a lot of people conclude their situations when they're in the penitentiary. If, somebody, if nobody told me, I wouldn't be here. Totally ignoring the fact that he did what they say he did. So he's got a seller. And the seller keeps telling him, bro, you can't be like this. You're not going to be able to do all your time like this. You bitter, you angry, you you everybody, you know what I'm saying, you encounter, you cussing them out, you mad at them, you don't want to be around nobody. He said, man, you got a long time to do. It ain't going to hurt you to be nice to somebody. It ain't going to hurt you to speak to people in a nice way. He said, you ain't going to get nothing out of this the way you acting now, but hard time. So he lay in the bunk and he thought about that. So he, he said, I'm going to change it up. I'm going to change it up. So he started being cordial towards people. And he learned that by doing that, the people, they allowed him to have more movement. They allowed him to do more things. They allowed him, and they, they would come to him and they would ask him, you know, is there anything I can do for you? These are the officers and the people that work at the facility. So now, instead of seeing that for what it was, he saw that as a way to manipulate his way through, like a lot of people do. So he's being nice, but in his heart, his, his heart is still black. His heart is still black. He's still got a lot of anger, a lot of resentment built up in his heart. You feel me? So now, his family, they want to come visit him. And it's hard for him because he loves his mama. You know what I'm saying? His mama has always had his back and his sisters and his brother. So he tells them, I'm not ready. He keeps putting them out. One year go by, two year go by. You feel me? So they finally call the warden. They tell the warden, just can we come to see him? He, we know he don't want to see it, but we need to see him. So the warden approves a special visit unbeknownst to him, and then they call him down to the VG, and he walks in the VG, he sees his whole family, and he breaks down. He can't handle it. He breaks down, and he starts to cry because he sees his mom and them. He hadn't seen them because he didn't want to see them, but he sees them, and he sees that he really messed up. It starts to dwell on him. He really messed up. But he gets himself together, you know, he walks over there and they hug and they kiss him on the jaw and they sit down and they eat and they talk and they share all of the things that have been going on the last couple of years on the streets. And his brother pulls him to the side. He said, hey, bro, I got that work. You find you somebody, man, that can get it to you. I got you, man. Whatever you need, I got you. 
at the time, bro, I ain't paying no attention to it. He said, okay, I, I understand what you're saying, but he wants to enjoy this visit, and he's enjoying it. And now he tells them before the end of the visit, he said, you know, pick up some visitation forms on your way back and send them back in. They said, we already got them. We already got them. The warden said they're going to expedite them and get them filled, get them approved so we can start to come to see you every week. We're going to be to see you every week. So when he goes back in, he's telling his seller about the visit and all this. And he's excited. He's happy for a minute. It don't last long. Because in the excitement of being, you know, seeing his family and the happiness that he was feeling, now that he's back behind the fence and he's in that cell, he's looking out that window and seeing the pod and all the people running around up and down. The sadness washes over him again because he's like, now it's really hard because I can't be with my family. I messed up bad. What am I going to do? So then he also remembers what his brother told him. He tells his seller, that's what his said, man, look here, that's how you can make you some money. You make you some money, you get your lawyer, you can get up out of here. You feel what I'm saying? So he calls his brother. He tells his brother, I'm working on something. He hollers his seller. His seller finds somebody, you know what I'm saying, that can make the move work. You know what I'm saying? So they coordinate and get all that together. He calls his brother, tell him, you know what I'm saying, where to drop it off at. He drops it off. His brother sent him two zips. Bam! Of that power. Now he's moving and shaking and he's getting money, he's making money. But he makes a call to a lawyer and the law, he tells the lawyer what the situation is. The lawyer said, I need 100000 up front before I even start working. Up front. He said, I ain't got that kind of money. He said, well, call me back when you get it. So he don't call the lawyer back. So he tells his seller what's going on. His seller said, man, we got some good jailhouse lawyers down here in the law library, man. They just as good as a lawyer on the town, man. They can get it, man. And then you won't have to pay, you know what I'm saying, that lawyer out there all that money. You throw these guys a couple of hundred dollars in a smoke sack, they're going to take care of the business, man, and get you, get, you, get you up out of here. So he goes down to the law library. And he's talking to the dude in the law library. And he tells the dude in the law library the situation, what's going on, and how the situation panned out, right? The dude in the law library said, I got you. And he starts talking about all these different issues that they can challenge, you know what I'm saying, on the appeal and all this and that, right? So he calls the lawyer that represented him, tell him, send me all my paperwork. You feel me? The lawyer said, I got you. He sends him all the paperwork because he'd already been denied on his direct appeal. A direct appeal is basically, you know, after the trial, you get to appeal to the judge that sentenced you that you say all of these things went wrong in the case. And the judge can make a determination that if you're right, he'll grant a new trial or, or something like that. If not, he, he denies it. Well, he denied him. So the next step is the Court of Appeals. So anyway, he tells him, don't worry about that. I'm going to do it myself. The lawyer says, okay, fine. He sent him all the paperwork. He takes it to the law library, to the to the law clerk, the law dude in the library. He working on the case. He comes back. to. He said, bro, I tell you what. He said, I can get you and her out. Now, when he said that, all that bitterness that was in his heart came back up towards her. And he said, man... F her. I'm not helping her. So the law clerk dude, he was like, man, you can really help her, man. I'm telling you, I see some flaws in this thing, man. He said, I don't want to hear that. Not helping her. So the law clerk dude, huh, check this out. He see an opening. He like, man, I'm going to get at her myself. So he sat down, he write her letter over to the women's prison. He tell her, he said, look, my name is such and such and such and such, and I'm working on uh, the case for such and such and such and such. He said, and I see your situation in yours. He said, I can help you. Write me back if you want me to help you. So she write him back. Now, he don't live in the building that bro live in. So bro don't even have a clue that she wrote him back. She wrote him back. And she telling him how sorry she is for what she did to, to bro and all this and that. He's skipping past all of that. He want to know, is she going to do this? And she said, yes, yeah, she'll do it. She said, you help me, if you help me, I'll help you. You feel what I'm saying? So she didn't have much money, but so she had her mama them send him $20, $30 every month. You know what I'm saying? She sacrificed what she needed over there for that. That's all she could afford. So to make up for that, the law clerk dude told folks, he said, man, this is what it's going to cost. He basically double charged him, but it still wasn't a lot of money because bro's making money in the penitentiary selling that power. You see what I'm saying? So now the law clerk, he's eating all the way around the board, and, and bro don't even know that he's talking to his ex that's over at the women's prison and helping her on the case. And guess what happens? After two years, after two years of fighting that case for both of them, she gets 
granted, on her appeal, they overturned her case. Overturned it, man. Overturned the case. And they ordered her a new trial. So now when she goes to court, they appoint her an attorney. The attorney said, you know what I'm saying, he wanted to get her out pending the uh, trial date. So they grant her a bond. Her mom and daddy, they had been working, you know what I'm saying, the time that she had been gone. They moved up in the socioeconomic level, you know what I'm saying, they middle class now. So they went, put the house up, got her bond, and got her out. Now she owned the town. She's on the town. Now, bro, tripping is like, because he gets a letter from her, you know what I'm saying, and saying that, you know, she tells him that such as she can't keep her mouth shut about nothing, you know what I'm saying. She tells, bro, that the law clerk that's working on his case was, has been working on her case at the same time, and she got out, and now she said she was going to go talk to a lawyer and try to help him get out, and you know what I'm saying, and, and her mom and daddy said they were going to help him. So he wants to be happy, but he's still angry, bitter, darkness in his heart. So he go to dude and he's shooting off on dude and dude said, look here, man, I told you, man, I could get her out and I can get you out. So bro didn't want to jump on her because he saw a little glimmer of hope, saw a little glimmer of hope. So he told him, he said, man, work on the rest of my case. He said, but you working for free now. Folks put the hammer down on him, you know what I'm saying? Because he went behind his back. But dude, don't he don't care. You know why? You know why? But he finna get out. He finna get out. Bro don't know. He done already made parole. He finna leave in six months. He got out date. He going home. And he got plans. He got big, big plans. He got big, big plans. So them six months go by. He's still working on bro's case. He working this thing. Trying to get him right. Trying to get him right. And he telling him this. He telling him. And bro even go to court a couple of times. You know, the judge denied. But then he said, I got you. And he appealed it. And it's going back and forth. Going back and forth. You feel what I'm saying? And right then... That's when they call him up and tell, they tell the jailhouse law, it's time for you to go home. He leaves. He gets out the penitentiary. And when he gets out the penitentiary, now nah, you're going to have to check out the next episode. I ain't going to tell you what he did. See, because you think you know what he did. You think you know what he did. I know what you're thinking. you thinking that he got out and he got with bro's girl. That's what you're thinking. Now, I know that's what you're thinking. Don't tell me that ain't what you're thinking. But I know that's what you're thinking. But anyway, you have to tune in to this next episode to find out, are you right about that? Or is it something else that's going on? Okay? Tune into the next episode. This has been another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker, and I say peace, y'all.